Hello, Kamundakon. Good morning. Wow. Tons of input throughout the last couple of days. At least that is how it feels to me. And there were so many interesting topics. So we learned about digitalization, that you want to get rid of all your documents, AI, there is Kafka, ZB, and all this other stuff around. But why do you want to get rid of tissue? I don't understand. But probably I should give you a little bit of input. Why? And just a short example. Imagine the following scenario. It's warm outside. You're in a conference, you're getting out there, and the only thing you're longing for is an ice cream. So you have ice cream, and it's warm outside, and it's super sunny, and suddenly your face is all full with ice cream, and you don't have a napkin to wipe your mouth. Terrible situation. Uh, no, that, that we are, don't want to do. So Good that there are still paper-based companies. Around. Exactly. There are paper-based companies, and we are one of those, because we, as Dooney, we produce napkins. And usually our customers are restaurants. And also you as end customers, when you go into the supermarket and buy napkins, and basically this is what we want to talk about a little bit today, all about napkins. I know it's Kamundakon, but now it's time for a little bit of paper. And for the future, what is the future? What does it hold for us? And this is basically what it is about. So just a little bit background about Dooney. So we basically know the environment we're talking about and why it's probably a little bit challenging for us. Dooney is a company that produces napkin asset. We have a paper mill in Sweden. We have a couple of factories throughout Europe. And we basically want to make sure that all of you will not get into the situation where you're lacking a napkin. Now, you can use napkins for various reasons. One is to just use them. Or you can use them to create what we call good food mood, which basically is that you create a nice atmosphere for you no matter where you are and for any occasion. So, as a company where you really like the corporate brand, use napkins. Print your logo on it, show your customers when visiting you that you're a brand with style and you really like it. So all of this we can print for you, tons of articles. Now, there is a little challenge with this one, our process. And just let me give you a little bit of background about the process. Profile print is a growing market. So no matter where you go in a restaurant, you want to have a nice atmosphere, and you want to see cool stuff on the table and feel good. But actually, our process looked like our sales reps were out there with the customer. They were basically looking, OK, what do you want to order? They created an Excel file, which they forwarded to our customer service. OK, I agree. I don't like paper in this regard. And customer service printed those Excel files out, entered them into the various systems, and to the next department, which was located in a different country, you would probably send an email. Not sure how it is looking in your company, but as said, we are selling all over Europe. So depending on where customer service is based and where graphics department is based, it's quite a distance in between. You cannot simply walk over. Good way of communication, email? We don't think so. So there was actually a challenge. What happens now if you want to grow? Increasing amount of orders? Likely to fail. Fully agree. And I guess most of you know the situation from other processes. So we actually had this challenge, and what to do? Well, this we discussed too, and we came up with a solution that we probably want to be more digital, using a workflow engine as an orchestrator, where basically our field sales is now running around, entering orders into a nice CRM system. They don't have to. There is a different slide on the monitor here compared to there. Um, nope, not this one. Nope. The one with the cloud. <laughs> Let's see. OK, so basically, let me tell you the story a little bit, because the slide doesn't matter. I'm sure you can imagine. So basically, our customer service is now running around with a tablet, where they can basically show this is how the napkin is going to look alike, and where they register the napkin order in a CRM system. This order, we basically, let's see. Mm -hmm. No. So. OK, so this order we actually um, take from the CRM system. It is basically loaded into the cloud, and there Camunda picks it up. And now our users inside the company, they're working with our front-end solution. And um, they don't have to worry anymore where the orders are stored. So they can basically go there, have a look at the order, and uh, they don't have to worry which system they're talking about. And Camunda, as an orchestrator, is now connecting to all the systems underneath. So for sure, you have your ERP system. There is this monolith that we heard about. Yes, we have one of those too, and it's quite old. So that we, there we found a way to connect to it, or at least get some data into the system. 
There is um, many other tools that we're connecting to. And um, this is actually where we wanted to be. So if you just could put up the slide with a process diagram for me, because that would actually be nice to show now. Otherwise, I could tell you all about napkin folding techniques, but that I cannot do at the moment, especially with the small thing here. So um, yeah, but basically giving you some background, the challenges here while they are fixing it. Um, the challenge for us, we as a napkin company, we wanted to be more digital. So we had this project that we started last, or actually we started this project last year in November that we started to discuss with the business how it's to look alike. Basically, to put up a picture like you would have seen, where it's basically the workflow as an orchestrator doing it, that's kind of easy to describe, but to define the process, that was a real challenge for us. And there we actually said that we took a team of business experts and our IT guys together in a room and told them, okay, now you have to discuss the flow. And on screen, you will sh uh, soon see how this one is going to look alike and um, how we execute the whole thing. So we defined the whole flow and we defined a user interface, a website. Um, a website where basically the user is logging in, where they can see all the tasks and all the templates. So we actually went away from all the paper and made sure everything is digital on one page for the users that they can see. And by doing it, we basically had the possibility to now execute everything online. And the heat map feature that you can also use to visualize to the business, hey, how is my process looking like? And this finally enabled us to see, oh, yeah, this is what we're doing. We were able to identify the flows that separated from the happy pass. And that's probably what you want to see. How is my process different from the happy pass? And in doing so, just going a little bit farther, when creating the happy pass that you will see hopefully on screen in a couple of minutes, um, then you will basically see that you're generating all kinds of data. And what will Frank will tell you in a couple minutes from now is basically how we can use all the data to predict the future. Because for us as a production company, it's important that we need to produce the napkins. You as a customer care, when is my napkin going to be at my place? And this is information that we somehow need to deliver to our customers. And for production, it's important that basically we know how much capacity on a certain machine do we need in order to print the napkins and so on, so we can actually optimize our planning if we use, um, if we use the data that we have in a good way. So, um, okay, so they're going to fix it. I'm positive. So this is actually digitalization when it works at best. Probably I should have had a, slide, a printed slide deck on napkins, for example. No, but, um, or, just a different remark for you. If you're looking into something bigger printed, we can print table covers and uh, middle. So these things that you can put in the middle and you get the, can get them up to 50 meters. Uh, so that is actually a good challenge for you. If you have a long process diagram, ladies and gentlemen, we can print it for you. Um, and that could help, even though it would be a little bit too small. Um, so where did I start exactly? We want to basically know how do we optimize production. And to us, it was like, it's quite easy to create reports from all the data that you have. But where do the reports really help you? Because once we see in the report that something is delayed, ah, there it is. Actually, this is the process. Yeah, there it is. Found it. Um, good. And what I wanted to show, what I wanted to show, the biggest challenge with the business actually is this one here that, oh, I probably clicked too far. That is, a return order. So basically, for the return orders, we defined a flow. Let me just can no the back click is not working here. No, I, I think I'm the connector yeah. now. You're the connector exactly to the blue one, first one, yeah. and now just the blue one and just click once. When let, probably let me. No. Actually, this does not happen all the time, so I can assure you. So for example. Yeah, there, no, there is. Perfect. It works. So basically, as said, we had a challenge to define the happy flow. And as you can see, there are quite a few variants. But what we actually want to know, how does an order need to flow? So basically, if you order a profile print for your company, we have to go this path. So we basically pass customer service, go through traffic department. There it is basically produced. We have some quality checks. We create sales order and all these kind of documents. 
And in this process that we created, we tried to automate as much as possible. And when it's not possible to automate, we created a user front that basically assures that you cannot enter crappy data because everything is basically pre-selected. And that really creates a benefit. In addition, we said this flow is probably not applicable if you just want to have your second order. And it's the same article. So there we came up with the flow, the green I now the green token, which is much shorter. So you basically take a big shortcut, and then it works. And we create the sales order, get the information to the customer. At any point in this process, from, um, from basically the customer co contacting us to sales order, we update all the systems that are involved. So no matter which system you will look into, you will always get the up-to-date status of your order. And, um, that is, for us, a big improvement in this flow. Now, looking at the next chart, this is how it looks to the users. As promised, we created the front end where all the templates are in there. You can see uh, in there that there's basically a to-do list. On the left-hand side in our front end, there are the templates. You have a strong history function where you can see basically all the decisions that we're taking, why they were taken, who has taken them, if the system has taken them, and why. And we can also attach files and all this kind of stuff. So a big help to the users, which really helped to gain their attention, and also the attention from the management, because suddenly there was something easy to use as a website that you basically knew how to use, because you're using websites all the time and templates there. And it really helped. So going a little bit forward, now we were running this whole thing for a little bit. And we found, oh, we looked at the happy flow, right? It does not look like the happy flow is happening that often. I mean, up there, the green one, like new orders, that is looking fine. But in the other areas, yeah, we're probably not so good with all those decisions. And there are still many orders in there which are running circles. And actually, that's what we don't want, right? We want orders to go through easily, and they should pass through. So we started to wonder what is happening. And what is the standard answer from management? And usually, what do you do in the business? You create some report. And there's another report requested. And yes, reports help. Reports are good if you basically want to look what has happened. But we were starting to wonder, what can we do actually with this data? So there's got to be more potentials like, what will happen in the future? Will our customers reject the order? Or when will it be ready? And how do we need to schedule production? How much capacity do we need to book? And especially as more and more systems, orders are getting into the system, how do we make sure that we plan the right capacity amount for those profile prints on our machines and stuff? So tons of good questions that we're looking into. And actually, what we need is this bubble, the crystal ball that is telling us. And then you hear everything about artificial intelligence and stuff. But again, we're a napkin company. We like to sell stuff. And we're not necessarily an IT company. We don't define ourselves as an com IT company. If you talk to our sales guys, IT company, no, napkins. OK, if you want to talk about processes and stuff, no, doesn't work. So basically, how do you introduce the ideas like of artificial intelligence and stuff? Well, there we found a good uh, research project. And it all started with the master thesis, where we were basically asked to supply some data, looking into the future for Dooney and how we can steer everything. And that's where I would like to right. hand over. Thank you very much. So this is pretty much a chronological presentation. This is the point in time where we actually met with a new process, which everybody was rather happy with, and which just had enough data to come to the idea there might be value in the data. So can we find it? We, uh, first of all, had the goal to predict the process duration of the process you just saw. And it's kind of difficult, because it, uh, it has a creative department in it, which is supposed to be creative. And it has a customer in it, which is also supposed to be um, creative, but which uh, makes decisions on its own, and you can't really influence his decisions. Uh, so we will try to investigate this rather small data set as of yet with an artificial intelligence method. With a twist, um, we will not be um, done at the moment. We have a useful model, but we also have the approach that we will want to explain what the model actually does. So we are not, not OK with providing black boxes. To show you what we are up against, this is a distribution of the process duration. Um, most processes are done rather fast. 
but there are some long-running processes, and the spike you see over there is uh, the processes that were still running while we were pulling the data out. But basically, this is kind of Gauss-shaped, and uh, you might have the idea to make a prediction by just predicting the mean value of this duration, and you come out with uh, about uh, a mean error of five days. So we're basically five days off uh, if we use this primitive technique of prediction. So what, what then happened is uh, the same as in every machine learning project. You split up your data. First of all, the, we had to reduce the data set because the happy pass which just presented is totally irrelevant for predictions because the prediction probably runs longer than the process. But for those processes where the creative department and the customers are involved, um, this will be interesting. So we have a reduced data set and come out with about 1,000 data sets, process instances in this case. And we split this data set up again to provide a validation data set. The idea is that we try to learn with the data set, the, the larger one, and hide 25% of the data set from this learning mechanism in order to be able to validate it with data that it has never seen, to just check whether it is a general whether it has a generalization capability or just uh, is uh, repeating things that it saw. So this is the most technical slide I have. So the method we came up with is uh, extreme gradient boosting. That is kind of a decision tree method I really like. A lot of people like it currently. And uh, how does that work? It is uh, an iterative process, kind of like a learning to golf with a scientific method. You, uh, I don't know how to golf. You probably see this. Um, you first try to identify the alternatives that you have. So you see golfing from a scientific perspective as a, a minimization problem. You minimize the distance from the ball to the hole. And you can do this with different options you have. You can diffuse different equipment. Um, you can use different strengths or different angles or different tricks I'm not really aware of, but you do this probably iteratively. So first of all, you find out that hitting the ball might be a good idea. And then in a separate step, you find out that hitting the ball is not always a good idea because you also have to head in, in the right direction. And then you have to hit the ball with the right strength in the right direction. And if you do that, you might overshoot the goal. You actually might overshoot the goal and have to hit it in the other direction to slowly decrease the distance to your target. And this is basically what this algorithm does. There is a bit of randomness in there, and uh, all in all, it is, of course, better to understand such a model than the uh, most quoted deep learning networks. And it's fast, and it can cope with small data sets. So this is the result we are currently very happy with. This is a slide I'm most proud of. Uh, what you see on the axis below is the actual duration of a process. Every dot is the process instance. And what you see over there is the prediction the algorithm made. And if these two meet on the diagonal, we were perfectly right. As you can see, the, uh, the fastest process in this random sample was actually predicted as the fastest one, and the same goes for the slowest one, but there is some variation in there. We will never get rid of this variation, but it's actually rather precise. The uh, reference number uh, of five days off, you can see that here, the black line is the average. So predicting the average has a rather large error. And uh, if we use this approach, we are currently down to 1.5 days average duration, RMSE, root mean squared error in this case. So I'm happy with that. But how does this work? Uh, there is a relatively new um, field of research in artificial intelligence, which is uh, explainable artificial intelligence. And I'm going to try that right now. Uh, what you see here is uh, the result of a so-called Lyme analysis from a clever guy called Mario Ribeiro. And you see a number of randomly selected cases below, along with the predictions we made and the actual value. And uh, 
we give explanation for individual cases, which, which will also be interesting for people providing insurance or loans or something like that. Individual explanations are a really powerful tool. Um, there are dots in two colors, purple ones and green ones. Green ones are a positive influence, a positive influence on a duration, so those are probably positive but undesirable, uh, and the other way around. So for the first case up there, you see that uh, the average duration of jobs in the last five days uh, was between 13 and 15.5 days, and that had a negative impact. So basically saying, if you are going fast, the next order will probably also go fast. We found this with a machine learning algorithm. You could also have done this with elementary school level time series analysis, but uh, the machine learning algorithm learns that as well. Uh, there are more interesting aspects to it. For example, uh, the type of folding sometimes plays a role, or the number of colors involved, or also, uh, that is really an interesting aspect from a business perspective, uh, the customer experience. We define customer experience as the, the number of interactions Dooney had with a certain customer. Um, you unfortunately don't have that many, uh, that many repeat customers. So this seems to be important for some of them. If they have experience, it is important. But for most of the cases, it is totally irrelevant because we mainly deal with new customers. And that is the kind of explanations you get out of this kind of model. There is another method I won't go into uh, due to time restrictions, but it's really interesting. Ask me. Uh, what you saw here is uh, one interesting aspect that I want to say um, is uh, the comment length. So the two red bars over there, the length of the comment in the data set seems to play a role. A comment is... Uh, as I understood something, your sales department enters as a, a guidance for the graphics department. And the length of this text field has explanatory value. And you can try to see this here. This is uh, harder to do with the naked eye than uh, with uh, statistics. You see on the lower axis the number of characters in this comment field, and on the y-axis the duration of the process we are looking at. And there is this uh, slight, slight sink on the left, around 50 characters, and we really investigated them. We're interested in, in why this is happening. Um, there is a, a pattern in the data set um, where the sales department tells the graphics department something like, oh, this is like order, order number here. And if this pattern occurs, there seems to be some copy-pasting going on. I don't know, but it's definitely making the process faster. Yep while everything else is pretty much noisy. All right. And this is uh, also highly statistically significant and, and something we'll learn about that. It's also interesting that this is definitely a, a nonlinear um, regression model which is used here. Um, we find similar things regarding other variables. For example, we can um, have a good grasp at uh, where the uh, the optimal zone of, of uh, workload for the graphics department team actually is, and if we need a bigger one or if we don't. Now to something uh, completely different. Um, this is the technology stack which we plan to use here. Uh, we're starting, of obviously, with uh, Commander Platform and with uh, some history event listener, which we uh, stole from our Process Warehouse product just to uh, get the events into a Kafka cluster where they are supposed to stay. The Kafka is, is good for transporting things, also for storing things, but you can't really, uh, can't really run um, analysis there or change data there. So um, we have a pre-processing step which is realized with uh, Apache Spark and uh, produces a convenient data table for machine learning. Machine learning Basically, all of these methods require you to have a large denormalized table, and uh, this is produced in that step. You can also do joins and integrate uh, third-party data, which we quickly found out was necessary here. The process data on its own was, was interesting, but we could not really get predictable results until we integrated it with your database. And then there is uh, the uh, favorite 
R programming language used for visualization and then controlling um, the charts you just saw. And then the H2O AI platform, which some of you might have heard of, but probably not. Um, H2O AI is a clusterable machine learning. So basically, all the steps you see here are cluster enabled and uh, are able to more or less linearly scale with the amount of data we see. And the nice aspect about H2O AI is that they're Java based, they're easy to deploy, they're easy to learn. And the result is a Java class. So I don't know if there are any people from Goldman Sachs here. Uh, this is basically the same idea with a different technology that drives the decision. Um, we're doing this with uh, another client of ours to, to, uh, to a prototype with uh, the um, Provenzalversicherung from Münster. And we have uh, found that most of this data pipeline is uh, reusa uh, reusable. So that's interesting. Um, once you have a prediction model, you basically have three options to apply it. You can either apply it uh, on event. Once we're, once we're in an uh, event pipeline, this is the obvious thing to do. Um, but this is probably not the use case Duni will have, because predictions are more uh, input to other planning processes. And you can't, can't really do your planning processes on event. This is more like Weekly. Mm -hmm. So we're in KC, which is the batch prediction. And uh, out of the box, without building anything, there is also this B option prediction service where you come up with a data set and the platform answers with a prediction and it does that really fast in a scalable manner. All right. Lessons learned. You want to start? Well, yes, um, I can. So actually, for us in this project, the lesson learned is that we had no clue how much we can get out of the data. So we thought, OK, we're just a napkin company, so we don't run orders like insurances do. We are actually far away from that, because we actually have to produce each single order. So we had a relatively small data set. But the yeah. data set that we got out of it was pretty cool. On the other hand, one thing that really was meaningful to us that we probably had some ideas what to look into in this process. So if you're talking to your expert, they basically say, oh, this is where it hurts a little bit, and this is where it hurts, and if you push there, it's bad. But actually, this analysis, this technology, enabled us to look at aspects that we did not never consider before, like the comment length. So actually, if that, as, as mentioned, if it works fine, that's good, but that there is like a special character load and special words in there that you can do. So that was a big learning for us where we can actually get a lot of benefit from in order to improve the process. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and another lesson learned is that uh, Camuna is useful in, in three roles, obviously as a data source, but also as a means to organize the life cycle of prediction models. Um, getting prediction models into production is hard. You can't really test them because they have this, uh, this tendency to have random parts, so the results may vary. And uh, you may have to have something like uh, four eyes principles or the statistic checks, things like that. And I, I think that there may be need for some kind of a more complex governance model, just as in, uh, in the talk uh, before ours, mm -hmm. to just manage which model and, and which AI project is at what stage. So, and also if you have. Um, a DMN table in your process already, uh, you're already halfway there. Integrating another technology for making decisions shouldn't be that hard. Mm -hmm. Yes. So. All right. And a uh, final point, there, there may be considerable value in understanding the prediction model. You don't necessarily have to integrate it into your technology. Just by seeing the results or translating them into a DMN table, uh, there may be value in that without even integrating new technology at any level. Yeah, don't delete your history tables. <laughs> right, yeah. that's all we have for you today. Thanks for your attention. We're happy to hear your questions. Thanks.